sucks to go to the gym and just claw for these minimal gains or just like work out for a year and see nothing happen or just slow the decline of muscularity in your 40s or 50s. That blows. It's good that you're doing it. Stay in the gym, but it blows. This drug and drugs like it could end that forever. Hey, everybody. So Dr. Mike Israetel of Renaissance Periodization released a hype-filled video essentially promising that this currently investigated medication combo will overtake steroids. And throughout the video, he recruits supreme optimism, and even though he labels his comments as hypothesis, he appears to translate primate data to specific results in humans that haven't been addressed or elucidated. And so I was inspired to look at these compounds even closer because it seems out of left field that a YouTuber known to promote exercise science would be excitedly pushing use of a currently researched compound. And I like Dr. Mike. If you're watching this, I'm a big fan. I think the mix of science with sporadic, dark, and twisted humor is entertaining. And I think it would be awesome to talk peptides with the guy. I imagine some of this promotion is likely due to his generally poor experience with anabolic steroids, especially from a mental standpoint, which is a topic that surely under-discussed. But the whole thing is a bit weird to me. I'll post some clips from his video so you know what I mean. Why take steroids if you have these drugs? When these drugs come out, they're going to get us much closer to the purpose of what I call the aesthetic revolution. This is a big part of it. And the aesthetic revolution has one goal, getting everyone into the bodies they want to be in. Okay, so after re-watching the video a couple times, this take, this excitement, it's almost dystopian. And it's what I would expect from somebody who works for the pharmaceutical company involved rather than Dr. Mike, whose content is rooted in exercise physiology and science among his interest in weightlifting and human optimization. Now let's actually talk about these compounds because they're not mechanistically dissimilar from things we've covered in detail in the past. The pharmacologics we're looking at today, which I'm back to mispronounce are trivogramab and gerudismab, and together they influence myostatin. Remember our videos on folostatin peptides and YK11? They act within a similar biological ecosystem, if you will. Myostatin is a protein that assists in regulation of muscle mass and limits the number of muscle fibers present. It's expressed in developing an adult skeletal muscle, and so people nowadays are interested in inhibiting myostatin, because if you inhibit a regulator, you have dysregulation. And so, in the context of muscle mass, it would signify unhindered muscle growth. And we see this in animals who have genetic mutations of the myostatin gene. Look up a picture of double-muscled cattle. These are cows who have such a genetic defect present and as a result are absolute units. As a part of a small physiologic subunit, myostatin and another protein that's called activin bind what's called the activin type 2 receptor, which induces the myostatin regulatory pathway that stimulates protein degradation and features of muscle wasting. And so the idea here is that if we block this effect from recurring via preventing myostatin binding, it can increase muscle mass. Though clinical research within this field has highlighted a disparity between the increase in muscle mass itself and the function of that muscle. Regeneron Pharmaceuticals is the name of the company that's developing the two drugs we're going to hone in on today. And we can tell by the names of these medications, trevogramab, gerudismab, that these are monoclonal antibodies. We see the MAB at the end that indicates such. So not peptides, not steroid hormones, but synthetically crafted antibodies that target specific binding sites. In particular, trevogramab binds myostatin, which you'll also see referred to as GDF8, for growth differentiation factor 8, and gerudismab targets activin A. Typically, myostatin and activin A bind the activin type 2B receptor, which leads to these catabolic effects of this pathway, the features of muscle degradation we touched on earlier. What's unique about this regimen is that since there are two antibodies at play, both myostatin and activin A are now neutralized, which prevents their binding to their receptor, which there and prevents muscle loss. This is why you'll see protocols involving myostatin called inhibiting the inhibitor, because that's what's going on. And together, these medications are known to activate what's called a dual GDF8 activin A blockade. Okay, are you still with me? If you are, and you like this sort of content, make sure to hit that like and subscribe real quick. It's the best way to help a mostly peptide buddy out. Appreciate it. Let's move on. Understandably, what comes to mind when we think about the clinical utility of these medications? 
probably not too dissimilar from the growth hormone augmenting compounds we discuss. Things like sarcopenia and muscle wasting, deconditioning and the setting of aging and chronic disease. Helpful stuff. However, of course, like with anything with potential in this space, it becomes a proposed performance and aesthetic enhancing drug. Quite likely more so the latter. Regardless, Dr. Mike made this video because of a couple recent data announcements. First, there was a recent release of top-line results in a phase 2 study called the Courage Trial, which means results weren't officially published but we get some teasers. And what this looks at in obese participants and humans is semaglutide combined with trivogramab and geritosumab, and the preliminary data shows increased fat loss and a strong muscle-preserving effect with the triple drug combo, somewhere between 50 and 80 percent, proposed to preserve the muscle loss that GL LP1 inhibitors like semaglutide are notorious for. The other thing he comments on, which is listed on the pharmaceutical advertisement for investors linked in his video, evaluates the utility of the dual GDF8 active in A blockade and GLP1 agonism in monkeys and mice. So these two drugs, as well as semaglutide. And by the way, the primary authors involved are also Regeneron pharmaceutical shareholders. So the different groups in these studies were a group receiving the GLP-1 receptor agonist alone, a group receiving the dual GDF-8 and active in A blockade alone, a group receiving the combination of GLP-1s and this blockade, and a control group. Both animal types were made obese through diet and they were trialed on these different medication regimens. Understandably, the dual GDF-8 active in A blockade showed the greatest features of muscle gain itself in both groups alongside some fat loss. However, as Dr. Mike points out, the most fascinating apparent results are the fact that the greatest fat loss was in the GLP-1 dual blockade group. But over time, this group also appears to be more prone to muscle gain greater than baseline. The monkeys and mice were only male, which is listed as a confounder. However, it's worth noting that results in each cohort appeared to resemble one another. And as the researchers point out as a way to confront this confounding variable that all the subjects were male, they did a callback to some research they've done on the past, and this was on the dual GDF-8 active in A blockade in postmenopausal females in a phase 1 trial. So lower sample size intended to assess for pharmacokinetic data and safety profile, where the results interestingly showed a dose-dependent increase in thigh muscle growth as determined by MRI imaging. And by the way, also Regeneron shareholders. The compound was found to be generally well tolerated with muscle spasms, aphthous ulcers, and headache making an appearance as the most prominent side effects. However, what I find interesting is that the treatment period for the GDF-8 active in A blockade group was six weeks and imaging was conducted over the course of treatment and after at 28 weeks. Now, by the end of the observation period, the visualized muscle growth had regressed, emphasizing that perhaps the anabolic effects require consistent dosing, which not only demonstrates the need to better understand long-term side effect profile of this combo medication, but it also leads me to question this. If the appeal is to prevent semaglutide-induced muscle loss and even promote some muscle gain, do these effects disappear if target weight and metabolic health are achieved, prompting somebody to discontinue the drug? And this isn't to question the legitimacy of the drug or the credibility of the research or even the very promising effects seen so far. It just highlights the need for more in-depth, longer-term, further research to really deduce what we know about the medication and what we don't, and I'm about to prove that to you. Because it's also worth noting, if you read through the supplementary materials provided in Regeneron's research, you'll notice that both in primates and in rodents, there's been some sort of unclear reproductive issue issues at play, some of which get better over time, some of which don't. In primates, testicular atrophy has been seen in some phases of research, and the active in A antibody in rats showed quite an inflammatory response, labeled as potentially testicular toxicity, showing epididymis inflammation and a negative impact on sperm quality. I'll also add that the recently published mouse and primate data didn't measure testicular or reproductive outcomes, which is quite surprising to me, since 
all animal participants were male, coupled with the fact that reproductive health is a clear concern when it comes to these medications. Moreover, the study that did look at postmenopausal women also evaluated the active in A inhibitor in men, but they made sure to do so in men who didn't want children because of these feared effects of testicular toxicity. And parameters of testicular function or sperm quality weren't even looked at. But in general, the myostatin active in pathway is thought to be entangled with testicular health and function, and for some time it's been thought that really messing with the myostatin pathway could in some way influence reproductive health, though it's something else that hasn't been fully elucidated. If anything, the vague reproductive effects alone are reason enough to hold the hype on this. Don't get me wrong, it's quite interesting, quite promising. The clinical benefit to me of possibly help people either improve metabolic health Health or really strengthen themselves in the setting of chronic illness and aging, I, I find this to be incredibly fascinating and really could benefit a lot of people. But with the level of hype it's been presented as, I'm not really there yet. On top of that, the results presented in the COURAGE trial in humans alone are, in my opinion, worth a pause at this time. Not only because the results presented are more or less for investors, it's not nearly published or peer-reviewed at this point, and also, unless the source are incorrect, multiple online databases have indicated that the study for all intents and purposes is still in its recruiting phase. There are just a lot of unanswered questions that I think we really need the answers to to be able to safely and beneficially utilize the compound in the general population. But maybe that's just me. You know, by now I like to worry about things, but I also like to get a better grasp of what we know and what we don't. I do hope you enjoyed this video. I didn't mean for it to be entirely a call out of Dr. Mike. Like I said, I'm a big fan. I'm going to continue to watch his content, but most importantly, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you are looking for more content and an ability to make frequent video requests, feel free to take a look at the Patreon. It's another way to support the channel. I've also got a 20-page guide on BPC-157 available so you could collectively understand the body of research that supports not only what we know about it, but also what we don't. And finally, we do have the recently released Peptide Codex catalog to get some brief summaries of different peptides, which is growing week by week. Links to all of these will be in the description below. Oh yeah, there's also a free mailing list. Why not? But yeah, once again, I appreciate your time. Hope you have a good one. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.